If you don't have a Bible, uh, there are some Bibles in the seats in front of you, some Bibles on the Welcome Center, otherwise iPad, iPhone. Um, We will be in uh, uh, Ephesians 5 for the most part today. And I'm going to read a bunch of it to you, but Ephesians 5, and if you need an iPhone app, it's called Version. It's a very good version if you want to download that. I'm going to read to you Ephesians 5, 1 through uh, 17 here. Let's read that together. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. And he says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfaithful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for, this, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed to the light, it becomes visible." For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Amen. So we're going to be focusing primarily on verses 8 through 17, but... 1 through 7 are also a a good add-on there. And we're in uh, the sermon series that we've been through two weeks prior to this and uh, been enjoying this. Hopefully you're enjoying this. We've kind of got a living room set up here because we want you to feel like you're in my living room today. We're just having a conversation about God's will for us. Now, at what point in your life have you felt truly responsible? For me, as I was thinking about it this week, One of the first places that really seemed to me that I felt truly responsible was back when I graduated from college. And and you see, it wasn't the graduation ceremony that made me responsible, no. It was when the bill for those years of college came (laughs) that I started to feel responsible, right? And then as I I thought about it, right, uh, what else, where else, when else have I, when, when have I felt responsible, right? Well, then I realized, well, when I got married to Kim, and since I was the best thing that ever happened to her, it was a pretty high threshold that I had to maintain. Why are you laughing? Come on. But standing before everyone that day, well, that night, um, standing before everyone that night, it, it was an amazing service, and standing there before everyone really set home the, the responsibility of what I was undertaking. It was a beautiful service. And we, as we set our vows to one another, as we were promising to one another, the, the reality, the, the responsibility for everything that we were promising to one another became very, very real in that moment. Good times and bad, right? In sickness and in health, whatever may come, we'll face it together. And, and, and that moment. That's a moment of of clarity when you are talking about that. And and, then the weight and the awareness of the responsibility of that moment was was upon me. And and maybe the next moment in my life where I really felt this responsibility was when we, uh, you can see, um, if you go back, it says, help, I married a pastor on the vehicle we were driving. But that's okay, you don't have to go back to it. But, uh, um, the next place was, was when I became, for the very first time, a senior pastor. Not only was I a senior pastor, I was a solo pastor. I didn't have anybody else on staff with me. And, and in that moment, when, when we were accepting that first call to full-time ministry, 
we, we, knew, we knew without question God was leading us there. So, so that part of it wasn't really unknown. And, and I remember Kim and I were laying there in, in, in bed that night after we'd made the decision that we were going to accept this call to this church. And we were talking about what we were going to do and what that meant. And, and, and Kim, in, in a moment of honesty and vulnerability, she asked me, she said, Are you sure you can do this? Uh, what do you mean? She said, Are you up to the task of preaching each and every week? And my response was, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. I, up to that point, I had never had to preach every week. So we weren't exactly sure how that was going to go, but God thankfully is there. and Thankfully, most of those videos are no longer online. <laughs> <laughs> I have gotten better. Um, I'm not saying I'm good. I just got better. That's all. But then, of course, came the big one, right? Our son, Justice, was born. And, and, and we ended up spending almost a whole week in the hospital. Uh, Kim was sick and, and you know, just some issues. But when we finally got to go home, and of course they walk you to the door of the hospital, right? Uh, we put our little guy into that car seat and we got him all strapped in, right? And, 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 and now, right, instead of two as we came, we leave with three. And now we have to figure out how to keep that number at three. I mean, you buy a cell phone and you get a half-inch thick manual. You have a baby, they give you a blanket and show you the door. <laughs> Talk about pressure and responsibility, right? And I think if we were to look at our lives and all that we need to be responsible for, we'd see that we're not only responsible just for ourselves, right? But we are also responsible for others. We are responsible not only for ourselves, but others as well. You might see that in your sermon notes there. For some of us, that weight does indeed feel like a burden. And that burden sometimes feels like it's way too much. Too heavy. I mean, at times we, we feel like we're a juggler trying to keep all the balls in the air, but the problem is not only are we keeping the balls in the air, but there's some fool who keeps throwing more balls at us and we've got to catch them and try to keep them going, right? Some of you moms know exactly how that feels. You're just keeping, trying to keep it going down the road. Other of us, others of us, maybe you're in a season of life, and, and praise God if so, <clears throat> or maybe you don't have a whole lot of responsibility right now. Maybe you don't have a bunch of others who depend on you, and maybe at this age and stage uh, you, you got a lot of free time, and, and, and that's awesome. Praise the Lord. And then, of course, there's a third category of people who are simply avoiding responsibility too, aren't there, right? There are those people. They kind of sidestep what should be theirs, letting the rest of us have to step up and step in and fix it and clean it and make up for it. Picking up after them, cleaning up their messes, picking up the pieces because they won't take responsibility. And we're in the middle of a, a sermon series here, Modern Family and Vintage Values. And the modern family, as we've been talking about, has great challenges in front of us. Yet God's Word still speaks wisdom and truth to us, doesn't it? Things that come into our lives are still spoken about by God in His Word to us today. Last week we talked about forgiveness. If you missed it, check it out online. It's a good, good uh, message, I think. And it was an important message because we learned that forgiveness begins with me. And if you want to know more about that, uh, the video is available online. But today we are looking at what it means to accept responsibility as men, as women, as followers of Jesus Christ. And to begin with, I want to show you a chart. They'll throw it up on the screen here. It's a, uh, a chart called the Reuben Hill, Minnesota chart. Some of you may have heard of this or seen this before. <laughs> Sounds kind of exciting, right? You came to church to see charts. Anybody? Anybody? Nerdy? Yeah? A couple of you? Well, some years ago, a sociologist by the name of Reuben Hill conducted a study of thousands of teens and parents here in Minnesota about how they enforced, enforced discipline and responsibility. And when they narrowed their research down to how they received love and how the kids received love and how love was given and how discipline was then enforced, he found that there were 
four different categories of parenting. And here we see the spectrum. It's the scale that they use is 1 to 100, top and bottom and left and right. And first, if you were in that first group, they were high in love but low in discipline. And then they were considered permissive parents. Though the kids were loved, right? They were cherished. They lacked boundaries. And this led to high levels of insecurity in those children. They didn't know where the lines were. These permissive parents tended to develop children who had low self-esteem and feelings of inferiority. And why this happened was because the parents were generally fearful of holding the line and fearful of being parents. So they never set up boundaries because they didn't want to upset their kids. The second group, oh, this is the worst group. The second group, they're low in both love and discipline. And this would be the neglectful parents. And this parenting style has neither love nor discipline. And this led to weak or no lasting relationship between child and parent. And what happens is many of them then grow up with deep emotional scars. And we would call these parents forsaking parents. The third group would be a group called authoritarian parents. They were low in love, but high in discipline, right? What happens here is because there's not much love, they frequently provoked their children to rebellion. And in this setting, communication was often combative and fighting, particularly as the children began to get older. And so frequently, there was a lot of fighting in these households and in these relationships. And then the final, the last group, is the authoritative parents. Loving, but not overbearing. Compassionate, but with firm authority. These would be the fellowshipping parents. They aren't perfect. They don't have it all figured out. But they're doing well, and they're moving their families in the right direction. Now, I know at this point, all of you have probably put yourself into one of those four categories, hopefully not number two. You've probably put your parents into those categories as well, right? Uh, we do that naturally. We like to categorize it, make sense out of things. And you might be thinking at this point, oh, that's the reason why I'm like I am, right? But I want to take it to another level. Seeing this and thinking about it is helpful, but what if we thought of this kind of chart or this kind of idea as being in the family of God, as being children of God. Do you see God as all loving but no discipline? Or maybe as all discipline and no love? I found myself in that camp once upon a time. Or do you have a good, healthy balance in between in your view of our Father God? In our passage today, the Apostle Paul is making these same connections. He's reminding people in Ephesus of who they were and who they are now. See, back, back before, they were a people who had no discipline. They had no idea of God's love and His faithfulness in their lives. They were living in darkness, living a life apart from God. And at the same time, now, now they are living in Jesus Christ. Now they are new creations in Christ. And now they know the love of God. They know that they love Him. And that He loves them so, so very much. That He died for them. Now they have come to understand what it means to be a disciple. And what it means to have discipline. The word disciple comes from the same word as discipline. They're, they come from the same root together. And so Paul spells out some ways that they need to take responsibility to be people of light and not of darkness. And to know, to absolutely know, God's love as well as His discipline. This was a message for them. But this is a, a message for us. This was a message for them about who they were, but who they are now. But this is a message for us as well. As men, as women, as mothers, as fathers, as brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, neighbors, friends, followers of Christ, all of us. It is a message for us. Paul zeroes in on how we assess 
our responsibilities and how we then enforce responsibility in those around us. Paul will give us three different ways today in how we can look at responsibility in this passage. The first one, Paul says, is accepting responsibility means seeking holiness. Would you say that with me? Accepting responsibility means seeking holiness. I do that to make sure you stay awake. I'm kidding. When we say it, it starts to begin to stick in our brains a little bit. So Paul says here in verses 8 through 10, he says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. Remember, were and are. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So again, Paul says the were and the was. This is who you were, but this is who you are now. Live as children of light. He's saying to take responsibility for your holiness. Take responsibility for the holiness of the people under your care. Are you seeking to be people of light? And so, I think of ourselves when it comes to what Paul is saying. It's not just to them, but it's to us. Us with modern families. Us as followers of Jesus Christ that are to seek the same goodness, to seek the same righteousness, to seek the same truth. This is who they were, but this is who they are now. But I want to say it also pertains to the family and what our responsibility is, no matter what your role in a family is. As parents, as grandparents, church members, community members, are you helping others to be holy as well? Are we intentional about our holiness? Well, I'll readily admit this is easier said than done, right? But we do need to seek God's ways, though. And it may be that we need to seek out those friends of ours who who we know are followers of Christ and that they they love us no matter what. No matter who we are, they love us. And they encourage us and they, they challenge us. But they also give us grace along the way as well. It means that as parents, you know, praying with your kids, reading with your kids, bringing God into the conversation, helping them... Uh, helping them to grow and helping lead them into a faith walk with Christ for themselves. Now, as grandparents, it can also mean, too, bringing in God to the conversation. You don't get off the hook today. Um, it means when your kids are visiting, bring them to church. Yeah, say, come on, we're going to church. When your grandkids are visiting, pray over a meal. Talk about God. Share your faith story. How many of you have told your grandchildren about your faith journey. If you haven't, do it. It's your story. Tell them about it. Tell them your story. Share how God is working in your life. Guide the conversation. If you're single, you still have connections and responsibilities as well with those who are around you. We all need to take responsibility for our holiness. Now, growing up, my household anyhow, we didn't really have a lot of these conversations in my family. We were deeply involved in church. You know, I was that that, that drug kid. I was drugged to church, right? That was me. We were deeply involved. My, My parents sang in the choir, so they were there early on Sundays. They were there for practice, I think Tuesdays, I don't remember, whatever day it was. They were there for that. My parents, uh, at some point in my life, took on the responsibility of watering all the plants in our church. And in this church, that's not a big deal. But in that church, it was a small forest. And it was, you know, literally an hour every time they went to water. And they watered sometimes twice a week, depending on the weather and how dry it was. So it was an involved thing, right? And so we did that. My mother used to bake communion bread. She had this, uh, oh, it was like a honey wheat that made you want more communion. It was good. (laughs) And uh, my dad was one of the Boy Scout leaders in the Boy Scout troop that met in the church. And so we were at church an awful lot. And my parents lived very moral lives, and they set good examples in most areas for us kids. Though we never talked about faith in a direct sense very much, but it was always abundantly clear what was expected of us. 
They were faithful, and they were always clear about what was right and wrong. Now, that I'm a parent, and as a pastor as well, so to speak, the shoe's on the other foot here, right? Now, I'm the one who has to try to figure out what that balance is of trying to help others growing in their faith while not shoving too much down their throats all at the same time. I've got to find that balance. Now, now I get to see that truly this is an easier said than done type of task. One of the simultaneous challenges and, and, and blessings of being a pastor and a father is the increased opportunity to help people to grow in holiness. And as a pastor, with that being truly my responsibility, comes an extra added layer of accountability to God for that. Someday, I will answer to God for you. So talk about responsibility. Don't do anything dumb. You're on my watch. (laughs) But we all have this responsibility at some level to help others around us to grow in personal holiness. So how are you doing on this? I love what Philippians 1, 9 through 11 says. It says this. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. There's that love, right? All of us love our kids, love our grandkids, our nieces, our nephews. And it's out of that love that we want to see that discipline, that discernment, so that we might see holiness in those in our care. And it's because we love God that we want to please Him. Paul not only says here in our, in our passage today that we should seek out the positive in this, but as we go back to Ephesians here, Paul tells us to also avoid the negative as well. In other words, accepting responsibility means rejecting and exposing sin. Say that with me. Accepting responsibility means rejecting and exposing sin. Sounds like a ton of fun, right? No. But it's important. Look back at Ephesians 5.11 again. Paul says here, Have nothing to do with deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Seeking Christ is not just seeking the positive, but it's also the avoiding, the rejecting, the exposing the things around me that are evil in this world. And this can be, this can be really easy to do in others, but hard to do in ourselves. Right? It's easy to see the problems others are having. It's easy to see their sins and call them out. But it's a little more difficult when we've got to be honest with ourselves about ourselves. I mean, do you have an area of your life you like to keep hidden? A book, a magazine, a bottle, a bill, a website, a behavior? Something that we wouldn't want sitting on the kitchen table when company came over? Something we like to hide, right? Something we'd like to pretend it's not even there. It's not enough, folks, to keep those things hidden. First, We aren't as good at hiding those things as we think we are. But second, hiding sin is a horrible strategy for personal and spiritual growth. Instead, Paul says, expose it, avoid it, reject it, bring it to the light, says Paul. You might be thinking about your sin. You might think, oh, but it's it's too ugly. Folks, it's not. You might be thinking, oh, my sin is too bad. I couldn't expose that. It's not. Deal with it. Hiding it. Hiding your sin is killing you spiritually. And it's keeping you from being able to lead others in this area as well. It's hard for us to help others if we are unwilling to work on ourselves. And particularly, this is true with with younger generations and the millennials in in, in particular. 
They will see right through you if you are faking it or if you are hiding things or if you're trying to cover things up. Don't do that. Be responsible. Step up. Deal with the sin. And then move on in freedom. Expose the evil, Paul says. But we have to be careful here. Let me give you a quick word of caution. This is where, if you aren't really careful, this is where you can come off as a giant hypocrite. Because we all have things that we see, right? And most of us have some things that we just kind of excuse or look the other way on. I mean, I can see the speck in your eye and not see the log in my eye, right? I can call out your sin, but be completely blind to my own. So just be careful that when you are exposing the evil in the world that you're doing so lovingly and humbly. Not from a place of pride and not in a gotcha sort of way. And then along the way with that, keep working on your own sin issues as you go along the way. So what kind of example are you setting for those around you? How you speak matters. It's hard to swear like a sailor and then turn around and try to help somebody with their holiness. It's hard to gossip and talk behind people's backs and say things about them you would never, ever, ever say to their faces, tearing people down, and then try to help their child or try to help their grandchild or, or then try to help your neighbor who heard all of the things you just say. How can you then help them Grow in faith. What you listen to, the things you watch on TV, the internet, the places you hang out, the things you spend your money on, those are all seen by those who you are responsible for. The things you do, the things you watch, the places you go, are all seen by those you are responsible in shepherding. Those you are responsible in helping grow in holiness. And it doesn't matter if you ask for this responsibility or not. If you are a follower of Christ, it is your responsibility. So what kind of example are you setting for those around you? What do you need to expose to the light with the help of the Holy Spirit and clean up? We can't be phonies ourselves and expect others to be willing to change. Sadly, apathy rules our world. It's far too easy to slide into a, everyone else is doing it. Who could this possibly hurt? It doesn't really matter. There really isn't a cost. This only affects me kind of mindset. And we, we lie to ourselves so easily at times in this regard. Don't fall into that trap. Don't be drawn in. This is discipline. This is what it means to be a disciple. As Paul says, are we exposing them? Are we taking responsibility for our sin? Now we can't just do this though and just we can't do it just to be a little bit more moral, okay? just to be a, a little bit more better than that other guy or that other gal. We can't just do it so we look better than others around us. We can't just do this so that now we have some moral superiority over others. That, that, can't, that cannot be our motivation. As Christians, we bring our sin into the light because we are loved by God and we want to do what God wants us to do. Other people are not our standard. God is. And I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, where he says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Not all things help build up. Yes, we can do all kinds and all sorts of things. We can be just like the culture around us, but God often calls us to something better. Not because everything is beneficial, not everything is constructive. It means taking responsibility. 
Now the last section there in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, this is where the rubber really meets the road. It says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What Paul is saying is that God does give us free will. He gives us the opportunity to make choices in how to live and and, and whether that is or not in holiness. We get to choose whether to be irresponsible or responsible. And the sobering thing is that one day we will be called to give an account for how we lived and how then we also help the others around us those in our care, those under our guidance, those under our influence, how we help them live and develop and grow. Responsibility means living wisely. Say that together with me. Responsibility means living wisely. Paul says, don't be a fool. Don't be foolish. The days are evil. And I think this seems just as true today as it was in Paul's time, right? This is, this is honestly precisely and exactly why I do not ever watch the news on television. Ever. Seriously, I don't. I quit a long time ago. Why? Because the news is not fit for adults nor children. It's foul, it's filth, it's murder, it's mayhem, it's destruction, it's carnage, and I frankly don't need that in my life. The world is a mess. The days are evil. And I don't want to increase my exposure to that in some uncontrolled sort of way. So, yes, I do stay informed in the news, but I am selective. With the internet, I can go to a website and pick which stories I want to read. I don't need to hear about the most recent murders. I don't. There's evil in the world. I accept that, and I know it is true. I don't need to hear about it every single day while I eat breakfast. And truly, I, I, I... loathe the 24-hour news cycle. I think it's one of the worst things that's ever happened to America. That's my personal editorial, but it drives me nuts. Because this news cycle we have, they have to keep generating news, right? And it adds stress, and it creates animosity, and it thrives on fear and conflict. None of those are Christ-like attributes. So be careful what influences you. Be careful what you take in. Be careful what you pass along in person. Be careful what you share in a call over email or on Facebook or for our younger generation, Snapchat or Instagram for that matter. Live wisely, Paul says. Because know this, Satan wants nothing more than to steal and kill and destroy every person in here, every marriage in here, every family in here, every relationship that you have. He wants to destroy it. He wants to destroy this church and the church as at large throughout the world as well. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. And to combat that, we must live wisely. We must truly and genuinely seek the Lord in our lives because these days are evil. We must, we must be wise. Being responsible is living and walking in the light of Christ's will and seeking that each and every single day. And knowing that if we we follow Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, the power is then within us to guide us. He is our counselor. He is our convictor. And He is there to tell us that is not good and we need to listen. Are we listening? Or are we walking the other way, looking the other way, ignoring the warnings from God and avoiding truth? You see, responsibility boiled down is loving well. It's disciplining well. It's choosing holiness. It's exposing sin. It's making wise choices. And we can can look to Christ for He was the ultimate responsibility model that we can look to. I mean, think of what He did for us. His submitting to the will of the Father and coming down to us, coming down here to our depravity, to our brokenness, meeting us where we are at in order to save us. 
See, Jesus was willing to be responsible for you and for me, for us, all of us. And the question is, will we take that responsibility on ourselves for others and ourselves as well? Will you be responsible? With the power of the Holy Spirit, I hope and pray that you will. Let's pray.